the third uh, strategies practice uh, webinar. Uh, I'm David Seidel. I'm a professor of organization and management at the University of, of Zurich. And I've got the pleasure to talk today about um, meetings and workshops and the role in strategy. I thought since Paula Jasikowski in the first webinar talked more generally about uh, um, the strategy as practice approach to uh, um, strategy, the practice approach to strategy, and Richard talked about theorizing micro and macro, and particularly the macro, which had been under theorized uh, for some time. I thought now I could talk about a more substantive uh, topic area uh, in strategy, which is uh, uh, meetings and strategy workshops, uh, where workshops is a, are a particular type of uh, meeting. I've done a lot of research in that area myself, and there's a lot of research around in strategy as practice and related areas. I thought it could be quite helpful for people interested in strategy as practice and interested particularly in uh, meetings to um, to learn a little bit more or to get an overview, and that's um, the, the main uh, purpose here, to give a little bit of an overview and get an overview of uh, what research is uh, out there on the role of meetings and workshops in strategy and uh, sort of where we uh, could sort of uh, continue developing more insights and getting any further. I've uh, prepared a slides for you, which I now uh, will start in a second, and I'll talk to these slides. Um, as I said, uh, these should give you an overview. I'll talk about uh, different. Um, I talk about uh, different studies, show what these different studies have shown. I don't go too deep in each of the studies because we don't have enough time. The idea is more to sort of direct you to studies that might be of interest to you if you're interested in the role of uh, meetings and workshops in strategy. So, uh, this is what I want to talk about. As you can see, a lot of issues. And uh, since there are so many issues, I won't go very deep into each of the issues, but sort of talk a little bit about each. I want to start with a practice uh, perspective on meetings. First, what are meetings and what does it mean to take a practice perspective on meetings? I irrespective of whether you're interested in strategy or uh, anything else, just when you study meetings from a practice perspective. Let me just start. In general, there are you could say three views on the role of meetings in organizations. The first view is, and when you talk to practitioners and particularly when you talk often to, um, to, to researchers, we say, okay, I'm studying meetings. Say, well, why meetings? Me meetings are irrelevant. They're useless. Everything else, uh, the, the important things are going on elsewhere. They're not going on in meetings. Well, that's not the view I take, um, uh, but that's one of the views. A second view is uh, meetings are the place where important things are going on. Not the only place, but one of the important places where th important things are going on. So if you want to capture important things, study what's going on in meetings. This view is very much sort of meetings as a container. It's just a place where things happen. Uh, um, and uh, it's uh, um, a good point to start studying strategy. The third view, and that's the perspective that I'm taking, or view that I'm taking particularly, meetings themselves are practices that shape what is going on within them. If you discuss things in a meeting, it's different from discussing things, discussing strategy, elsewhere in ch uh, um, chance encounters over dinner uh, or over, over lunch or whatever. Yeah? And uh, that's what strategist practice researchers in particular have looked at. So now, some statistics just to get us started. Um, I mean, these are all the studies that have uh, examined uh, uh, meetings, meeting practices, particularly in the Western world amongst uh, large organizations, but these just indicate that uh, meetings are a pervasive phenomenon and a costly phenomenon. Managers spend between 60 to 70 percent of the time in meetings, at least in the Western world. Yeah? More than 11 million me meetings take place in the U.S. each day, or at least a million meetings take place, uh, um, 11 million meetings take place in the U.S. each day. The figures are a bit older, so they might even be higher. And organizations like 3M spend 7 to 15 percent of their personnel budget on meetings. So meetings are costly and pervasive. And even if they don't have any impact, which um, the uh, uh, research has shown they do have, but even if they ever hadn't, um, there would be a point about studying them because they are so pervasive and so costly. Now, what are meetings? Uh, there are different definitions of meetings. And together with a colleague, Stéphane Guerin, uh, we put together sort of different uh, defining um, characteristics of meeting into one definition. Um, taken particular from, uh, from the, the gurus of uh, meeting research, 
uh, Helen Schwartzman and the other uh, uh, the Bowden. Um, meetings are planned in episodic communicative events that involve several participants co-located in the same physical or virtual space and whose purpose is ostensibly related to the functioning of the organization or group. Yeah. Let's just uh, uh, zoom in to the, uh, into the central characteristics of this definition. So uh, meetings are planned. Uh, um, a chance encounter on the corridor is not a meeting. Uh, they're episodic. They have a clear beginning and an ending. And that also contributes to the dynamics within the meeting. You know that the meeting will come to an end at some point, And that's why you sort of need to speed up the discussions or whatever. So it has an effect on the meeting. Meetings are very much focused on talk, even though often in meetings you also might do other things rather than just talking. But the focus of the meeting is the talking. It's a gathering. Uh, several people come together. I mean, there's a little bit of a disagreement whether two people already make a meeting or three people. Actually, Helen Schwartzman argues that it needs three people to uh, call it a meeting because it allows for different dynamics, two against one, whereas a one-to-one -one would not be a meeting. Uh, Deirdre Boden has a different view. She says actually a meeting starts from two people. I once uh, talked to Helen Schwartzman about it and said, well, what if you have a meeting with three people and one person leaves? Is it no longer a meeting? And then she said, well, actually, in that case, I think actually we could say two people already make a meeting. We can leave it open here, but um, these are uh, at least a uh, meeting needs more than one person. And uh, some would say needs at least three. Co-location and space is important. Uh, co-location is important because if you co-locate it virtually or, or physically, you see what the other person is doing and that's also communicating part of it. Emotions, you feel emotions more when you're co-located and so on. And um, there's official purpose. Yeah? Official purpose ostensibly related to the functioning of the organization or the group. And that uh, purpose is the official ostensible purpose, uh, even though individual participants might have other purposes. And um, as I say, uh, as it says here on the slide, there are different examples, wide range of different types of meetings, on-site, off-site, open, closed meetings, regular, irregular meetings, and so on. And these different characteristics of meetings, they're all meetings, they all have these uh, central characteristics that are listed here, but they also shape sort of what is going on. Now, uh, when you study meetings from a practice perspective, you can look at uh, meetings themselves as practices. Yeah, and you can look at what uh, uh, goes on. I mean, what uh, uh, how how meetings work, as such how what uh, the different elements are of meetings, and so on. You can say meetings um, can be seen as part of other practices. For example, strategic planning. Strategic planning itself is a practice, or budgeting is a practice, and that involves meetings. And you can study sort of the contribution of meetings to that larger practice, like strategic planning or whatever. Uh, meetings con. To, uh, contain themselves several other practices. You could say sub practices or individual meeting practices, such as setting an agenda or chairing a meeting. These are practices that are specific to meetings, and you only find them in meetings. They don't happen elsewhere. Yeah. And then you have uh, uh, um, other uh, and meetings also contain practices that can also be found elsewhere. Yeah. So, for example, the use of PowerPoints. You can use PowerPoint in meetings, but you can also use elsewhere. And you could look at what it means to um, to use PowerPoint in a meeting as compared to using it elsewhere, and how this affects sort of um, the practice of using PowerPoint. Now. Um, let me take go a step further. Um, when we talk about meetings and the role of meetings, we think of different uh, ways in which meetings affect the organization at large or affect strategy. We can also talk at, about uh, different functions that meetings might fulfill for the organization in the organization itself. And together with Katharina Dittrich and uh, uh, Stefan Gerard, two colleagues, we looked at their entire meeting literature and they talk about different functions that meeting might have. Yeah? I don't want to go too deep into that, but just uh, uh, highlight a couple of points. In general, you can say there are uh, five types of functions that meetings might fulfill. A coordination function, that's the typical function that one thinks of. They synchronize different activities, they pool uh, and distribute information and so on. But they might also have symbolic function, like legitimating the established order or uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, reinforcing status 
or um, signaling status change. For example, being invited into the executive meeting is uh, might uh, signal a status change of an employee. Um, a social function like team building, development of organizational identity, uh, a political function. Uh, meetings are the place for bargaining. Yeah, um, they set, uh, they help setting a, uh, uh, the agenda and advancing an agenda. Or they can also have cognitive functions like sense making. Carl Weick talks about the meeting as the main uh, practice of uh, sense making. The meeting is the organization writ small and so on. So different functions and uh, meetings often have a combination of these different functions and uh, they might be um, officially there to coordinate things, but actually they might more serve a symbolic function. At the same time, it might be used for political functions and so on. So that's what I wanted to say, first of all, about meetings in general and a practice perspective on meetings and studying how meetings uh, contribute to organizations in general. Now let's look more specifically at the uh, um, effects of meetings and particular meeting practices on strategy. Starting that, we might first say what makes a meeting strategic? Yeah? Um, and why uh, would uh, strategy scholars study particular meetings? Well, first you could say there are certain meetings that are explicitly labeled strategic, a strategy workshop, a strategy meeting. And obviously, uh, all these strategic and uh, practices that are explicitly called strategic are of interest to strategy researchers. So that's obviously a strategic uh, a, a, a meeting of strategic relevance because it's a strategy meeting. It's called strategy meeting. Um, but even when a meeting is not called strategic, it might be relevant to strategy researchers. Yeah? because meetings uh, can be site of strategy work. So even a meeting that is not called strategic might be a place where people might do SWOT analysis, for example, or think about the future direction of the organization. So they do strategy work, even though the meeting as a whole might not be called strategy. But even when uh, meetings are not called strategic, and if you don't have explicit strategy work going on in there, even if you don't have strategists in there, uh, meetings might be strategic in a sense that they might be consequential. Even an operational meeting might be strategic in a sense that it has strategic consequences. Uh, treating meetings in that sense as strategic means that you would have to look retrospectively or you can only define retrospectively whether those meetings are strategic once you have seen whether these meetings are consequential whether they have consequences for the organization. Okay, now um, let's look more closely into meeting practice. The practices make up strategic meetings. And uh, there's one framework that I find quite useful, um, uh, one uh, framework that I've uh, worked on uh, together with my colleague John Henry in a paper published in 2003, where we said actually Looking at meetings, we can uh, uh, conceptualize or, or uh, uh, capture the meeting in terms of three uh, three uh, points in time, or well, not necessarily points in time, but three aspects of the meeting. First is the initiation, the initiation practices, setting up the meeting. So, what are the practices that you uh, uh, that are there in order to set up the meeting, like um, the, the, uh, defining the location of the meeting, inviting people, and so on. Then you have conduct practices, practices uh, um, uh, or, um, that are going on during the meeting, in the meeting itself, particularly communication practices, yeah? um, turn taking within the meeting, for example, or different forms of different practices of turn taking within the meeting. And then you have termination practices, uh, which do not necessarily have to be at the end of the meeting. They can also be actually happen already before the end of the meeting. But these are practices that link what is going on in the meeting uh, to the wider organization context. Yeah? Or practices that uh, sort of uh, prevent certain events within the meeting to spill out or spill over into the organization at large. And I'll use this framework of initiation, conduct, and termination now the following to talk a little bit about uh, research findings or different studies on meeting practices and the effect in, uh, through which meetings play out. So uh, in uh, one of the studies that I did with Paula Jaskowski, 
uh, we looked at meetings within uh, within um, a university within a university context and identified particularly practices of setting up meetings. And these were uh, setting the agenda, selecting the chair, setting the location, and so on. And uh, apart from identifying these practices and uh, the many practices uh, like that, we, we looked at the extent to which the, the, these practices affect what is going on in the meeting. So, uh, for example, um, setting the location, we found that uh, depending on how you set the location, where you set the location, whether the meeting is taking place in the offices of the top management team or uh, outside the organization or in a neutral place affects very much the power dynamics uh, uh, and the distribution of power within the meeting. If you have it in a central location, the top management team has tends to have more power than the others uh, uh, due to different reasons. Same, similarly, the selection of the chair, whether there is a chair or no chair and uh, who is the chair and so on. Then let's uh, look at conduct, conduct practices. Yeah? So um, what is going on within the meeting? So you have um, several studies that looked inside the meeting and looked at particularly the dispersive practices and communication practices within. And there are two studies that I find particularly interesting uh, that I mentioned here, Woodard and colleagues, one from 2011 and one from 2014. And they looked at the discursive practices that, um, first of all, chairpersons use in directing uh, strategy meetings. And they identify five practices, um, bonding uh, uh, um, practice, for example, the chairman uh, or chairwoman uh, talks about we are doing this instead of I, so creating sort of a sense of uh, 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 community, um, encouraging, which means soliciting opinions, directing, bringing discussions to an end and uh, uh, directing the discussion, uh, um, re uh, committing, recommitting, so um, getting people to make uh, promises and uh, uh, committing them to courses of action and modulating, which is balancing um, sort of the encouraging and the directing. Yeah. What is particularly interesting, the details don't matter here, what is particularly interesting here is sort of how you have practices that go in different direction. You have practices of encouraging, inviting uh, opinions in, inviting uh, um, voices in, uh, and directing, which is sort of uh, um, closing down and, uh, and, uh, and um, doing the opposite, actually uh, um, pushing certain views or certain directions and not uh, others. And uh, these create tensions, which and, uh, through the modulating um, uh, um, can be balanced. Uh, so modulating is balancing, balancing on the one hand the, the, the encouragement and the directing. Yeah? And a lot of research about uh, on meetings and workshops actually do uh, focus particularly on these counterbalancing um, uh, um, counterbalancing practices that allow on the one hand to open up and close down, direct or invite, uh, um, in, introduce uh, uh, differences and reduce differences and so on. Um, a second study, uh, similar studies, uh, study by Kwan et al, uh, um, also colleagues of Budak, um, looked at uh, particular discursive practices that are employed in developing uh, collective views of strategic issues. Uh, redefining um, the issue, defining, redefining the issue, simplifying the issue, equalizing um, uh, uh, and legitimating, reconciling. And I just home in on the equalizing, legitimizing. Equalizing means like sort of opening up, allowing people in, legitimizing certain views and closing down. So again, you see here sort of on the one hand, opening up and closing down. And what is interesting to look at sort of the dynamics between these different types of, uh, uh, of practices, how they balance each other out. I don't want to go too deep into these studies, but they are fascinating studies that you should have a look at if you're interested in this, these kinds of studies. Let's continue. Now, uh, other conduct practices, uh, also going back to the study that I did with Paula Jaskowski, we looked at different practices of turn-taking, yeah? turn-taking practices in uh, meetings. Um, and uh, we uh, distinguished here free discussions where um, everybody could react to everybody else uh, without uh, uh, any interference from any chair. So uh, the, the discussion can go freely, spontaneous reactions to each other. Restricted discussion 
where um, the chair person clearly assigns uh, the right to speak. Yeah? So you cannot uh, spontaneously react to each other or restricted free discussion, which looks like free discussion, but uh, where uh, the chairperson interferes from time to time. Yeah? And what we looked at, uh, what we showed in our study is that uh, these uh, turn-taking practices have very different effects on stability and change of strategic orientations. By stability and change, we mean the extent to which uh, new ideas uh, emerge that, uh, um, that challenge the existing strategic orientations or um, to what extent um, the existing strategic orientations are reproduced and reinforced. Yeah, and what we I'll come back to that later. But what we find, for example, is that in free discussions, um, you tend to have a lot of new uh, um, ideas emerging, or in free discussion, new ideas emerge. Whereas in restricted discussions, uh, um, new ideas are more or less uh, killed off or do not even come up. Um, then uh, another very interesting study, and that's the last one that I want to talk about in terms of conduct practices, is uh, the study by uh, Feng Yu and Sally Maitlis in 2014, in which I looked at uh, practice of emotional displays and how emotional displays affect uh, um, uh, strategizing. Uh, they talk about energetic exchange, amused encounter, discord interaction, and so on. I don't want to go through all the practices, but what they um, show is that uh, positive emotional displays are generative uh, and uh, negative emotional displays uh, uh, lead to truncated strategizing. Uh, I can't go into the details, but it shows sort of the, how emotional practices actually affect uh, uh, how uh, people strategize or how organizations strategize. Okay, now uh, I come to termination practices. Yeah, remember we talked about initiation, conduct, now termination practices, and uh, back to a study that I did with Paula um, on uh, in the university context, uh, we identified particularly four important uh, um, termination and linking practices, which is rescheduling. Often you have strategic issues coming up, but they get rescheduled in other meetings, and that's very important, as I will show later on, and I'll talk uh, about later on. It's very important, these rich schedulings, for new ideas really to be developed and having a chance to challenge existing strategic uh, um, directions. Um, setting up working groups, yeah, rescheduling and setting up working groups which develop ideas further. Voting, yeah, we saw that uh, particularly in the, uh, um, in the university context, voting in, uh, in that context was very interesting because voting tends to be something that closes down and tends to deselect uh, even when uh, something is positively voted on it tends that the the, uh, um, the very fact that you resort to official voting unless it's some uh, um, some just formality but uh, once you resort to actual voting and not just ceremonial voting the voting tends to deselect yeah, because it is an indication that there's uh, um, there's not not uh, um, clear agreement around an issue and uh, finally, stage managing, recoupling, something that we also found a lot is uh, that once ideas have been developed, that uh, um, there is uh, um, quite a lot of discussion around um, how to present developed issues, developed ideas to uh, the ultimate decision making bodies. So these were uh, different uh, meeting practices, an overview of different meeting practices. There are more studies, but uh, I just uh, wanted to show you sort of uh, um, examples of studies that have highlighted uh, uh, different practices and have looked at how these practices uh, affect strategy making, how they affect strategy making differently. And what they also showed, in particular, the studies uh, by Woodock and colleagues, um, that's often um, the combination of practices that uh, ultimately uh, have a particular effect. Um, connected to that particular point, I want to look now at um, studies that had, have uh, examined the way that different meetings relate to each other over time, linking meetings over time. And um, I, I'll talk about two studies. One, uh, I'll talk a little bit more because I know it better because I've got, I was involved in myself and because I've uh, already mentioned a little bit of that, uh, which is the university study. And then I'll briefly talk us about the second study, um, also by Paula Jasikowski, but with Paul Spee, in which I looked at a, a somewhat different aspect. Um, so this study is uh, a study in which we examined 
how strategic issues travel across different meetings yeah, in a university context. And so we tracked 15 new strategic ideas, 15 new strategic ideas that popped up in a strategic meeting, and then, then went through different uh, meetings until uh, they, these new ideas were finally taken up yeah, uh, or were um, ultimately deselected and disappeared. Yeah? And what we had here in that case, 11 of the new ideas that we tracked led to a positive selection. They actually led to a challenging of the established, uh, established strategic orientations. Uh, um, while uh, the other four that we looked at, um, past two and three, uh, traveled through different types of uh, meetings, had a different uh, path through a series of meetings, which ultimately led to a deselection and thus uh, um, to a preservation of the status quo. Let me just take you into that study. It's a little bit complex, but uh, I'll summarize at the end. So if you can't follow all of it, uh, um, at the end, it should become clear. Okay. So. Um, how do uh, 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 meeting practices uh, influence the take-up of new strategic ideas? The uh, three paths that we identified. So 11, um, well, actually, all the 15 ideas that we tracked, they emerged in a meeting with free discussion, or at least restricted free discussion. Uh, the free discussion was uh, um, sort of very... Uh, um, generative in the sense that people could spontaneously react to each other uh, a little bit like brainstorming sessions. I mean, once you can react freely to, to each other uh, and bring the different perspectives to each other, that's more um, a, 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 quite a fruitful context for new ideas to emerge. None of the ideas emerged in restricted discussions. Yeah? And we also have other turn-taking modes that uh, I don't want to mention here uh, or don't get into it, but they are also more restrictive uh, turn-taking modes uh, that uh, did not allow for new ideas to emerge. So all 15 ideas emerged in, uh, in, uh, uh, in meetings with free discussion or restricted free discussion. But 11 of them uh, were then rescheduled uh, into other meetings and uh, uh, where in free discussion, in working groups and so on, these ideas were further developed. Because uh, once a new idea emerges, the new idea typically, if it's a really challenging idea, if it's a really new idea, it tends to be vague, un uh, um, uh, unclear, uh, not really adjusted to the uh, particular context of the organization and so on. It needs further development. So without further development, um, the, the, the idea doesn't have the chance to be taken up and to really challenge what is already there. Uh, it doesn't have the chance to challenge uh, the existing status quo. So um, the rescheduling allows for the further development of this idea and the free discussion working groups, they allow very much uh, for new ideas to come up, uh, to, to be further developed. Once uh, um, these ideas circulated through several rounds of meetings with open free discussions. Uh, we came to a stage where this idea was finally developed and entered into a stage where they, um, where we found a practice um, that we call stage managing, where the um, uh, people in the meetings discussed how to phrase and frame the idea, uh, how and when to present it to the final uh, deciding body. And um, that was a very important point because that meant uh, adjusting the idea to the organization context, to the structures of the wider organization, such that it has a chance to be picked up. And in the 11 cases, that then let, failed, uh, 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 resulted in a change, a challenge of the status quo, and finally, the change of the status quo. Now, let me uh, talk about the second um, path. The second path, again, started in free discussions. Yeah, uh, new ideas emerged in free discussions or restricted free discussion, but then it moved into a restricted uh, discussion or restricted free discussion. Yeah, it moved into meetings that no longer had uh, free discussions, uh, or it was even in the same meeting where it was then restricted um, in the discussions. And actually, in uh, one of the cases, um, uh, um, the, the uh, movement uh, into, a, um, into a meeting with restricted discussions was actually meant to help the development of the new idea. Yeah? So the chairman um, had uh, explicitly moved this into a meeting with restricted uh, discussions 
uh, or restricted free discussion in order to uh, prevent uh, um, uh, um, critics of the idea to destroy the idea in order to uh, make sure that the idea uh, would be positively discussed and no negative views would sort of uh, 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 um, uh, get in the way. However, interestingly, because of the restriction on the discussion, the idea never developed uh, um, so much that they could actually challenge uh, the existing status quo. Um, you still had a lot of opposition to the ideas, yeah? uh, which uh, meant that at the stage where the idea finally had to go to, um, to the selection, um, they went for voting yeah? um, because it was unclear where it would go. And uh, in one case, the idea was voted that the idea was voted down. In the other case, uh, um, the positive the vote was positive. But because there was so much conflict around the ideas, because they had not been uh, sorted out and not developed enough, and uh, there hadn't been any consensus developed uh, uh, through open uh, and fr uh, free discussions, that uh, ultimately um, even the positive, uh, positively voted idea uh, ultimately got deselected, never got implemented. And uh, now let me talk about the third path, which is a little bit of a combination of the first two paths. It starts off again with a new idea emerging in free discussion or restricted free discussion, moving into um, uh, through rescheduling into free discussions of working groups, and then um, so developing there somewhat, but then something happens which is interesting as um, the chairman took control of the process. Um, it wasn't uh, uh, because he wasn't a fan of their uh, um, new idea, was actually trying to prevent this idea from really developing and being accepted. We moved it, uh, moved it into uh, meetings with restricted discussion, um, tried to uh, close down discussion, not allowing too much uh, discussion around these ideas really to emerge in that uh, and in that way, try to try to frizzle out and, and sort of destroy the idea such that in the end, um, the idea just disappeared and was never talked about it again. Yeah. So what do we see here apart from the details which are not important and which is some of uh, the, the um, and some of the practices identified here might be specific to university context. Uh, but what do we learn here? First of all, um, different combinations of meeting practices across different meetings are required for the development of new strategic ideas. So it's not possible to bring up a new strategic idea and uh, sort of develop it in the meeting and then uh, with that new idea in the meeting challenge the status quo. It takes several meetings with different meeting practices uh, for new ideas to develop and to have that to stand the chance to uh, challenge the status quo. Uh, secondly, it is the particular combination of practice across different meetings um, that determine whether um, uh, um, an idea is actually developed to a stage where it has a realistic chance to uh, challenge existing strategic orientations or whether the status quo is preserved. So it's the particular combination across uh, meeting practice that is important. Yeah? And for example, uh, you need sort of uh, um, some develop uh, practices that are good for developing the idea and you need other practices that are good for um, um, sort of preparing the idea and uh, stage managing the idea for the final acceptance. And these happen across time, across different meetings, and it's this combination that is important uh, uh, in, the uh, in uh, um, determining whether an idea will ultimately st uh, stand the chance to challenge the status quo. Okay, now let me quickly and briefly talk about another study that also looked at uh, the relation between different meetings over time and different meetings to each other. And that's a study looking at, uh, the, uh, at different meetings or series of meetings uh, that, uh, that uh, are engaged in developing a strategic plan. So what you had here was different meetings talking about different versions of strategic plan that was then taken up in the next meeting again, revised in the next meeting and, and so on. And what, um, what uh, um, Paul Spin and Paula Jaskowski show very nicely in this, um, in this uh, study is how the um, different versions of the strategic plan connect across meetings. What, so what you have is you have the discussions in the individual meeting about the new strategy, the strategic plan, that get, then gets translated 
into a strategy text, yeah, in into a uh, um, new draft of the strategy plan, uh, fixing sort of the ephemeral meeting talk, yeah, thereby decontextualizing it, taking it out of the particular meeting uh, uh, context of the meeting talk, um, and uh, then this uh, um, th this new draft then moves into the next meeting where it's taken up again, where it has to be interpreted. Yeah? People start then interpreting what did we mean here, what does it mean here, and uh, thereby recontextualizing the text into the context of that specific uh, specific meeting, where then uh, they discuss um, uh, continue discussing the strategic plan, which then again gets. Uh, moved into or translated into uh, um, a new draft of the strategic plan, fixing what happened in this, in, in, in this new meeting, and then moving back into uh, and so forth into following meetings. So you see how sort of different uh, texts or versions of text connect uh, across different meetings. That's much more in, in the study than what I'm highlighting here, but this is an interesting aspect that I wanted to highlight in this context. Now, let me move on uh, to the next point. Um, the relation between meetings and the wider organization, and particularly how does the wider organization impact the meeting itself? And just want to highlight a couple of studies that have looked at the impact of uh, the wider organization and structures of the wider organization on the individual meetings. So um, uh, Clark and colleagues have uh, uh, nicely, in the study, nicely highlighted here um, sort of the different uh, um, impacts or different effects of, uh, uh, of uh, um, what is happening or the wider context around the meeting on the individual meeting. So uh, they said, so one aspect is uh, um, interdiscursive relationships. So what's happening in the meeting, the talk that's happening in the meeting relates to talk that's happening outside, yeah, the previous talks, yeah, uh, um, uh, um, outside uh, meeting talk, pre-meeting talk, and so on. And that's very important to see how what uh, this pre-meeting talk actually impacts um, the talk that's happening in the meeting. And I'll briefly um, say something about this uh, in the following. Then also extra linguistic, social, and institutional context of the meeting. So the hierarchical positions of the participants in the organization also impact. In, on the meeting dynamics inside. And then beyond that, there are also broader sociopolitical and uh, the broader sociopolitical and historical context that also affects obviously what's happening in the meeting. For example, in uh, different uh, um, cultures, you might have different meeting practices that affect actually what you're doing in the individual meeting. Let me briefly say something about the first two points, interdiscursive relationships and extra-linguistic social and institutional context of the meeting. So the relation to pre-meeting talk. Um, Christina Hoon has done a very nice study uh, looking at uh, committee meetings in a university. And she showed how the informal conversations outside the formal meeting uh, created uh, uh, alignment around strategic issues and provided opportunities for making pre-arrangements for the formal meeting and thereby impacted very much how people talk in the individual meeting. And uh, she shows very nicely that you cannot understand what's happening in the meeting uh, and why people behave in particular ways in the meeting without also looking what is happening before the informal conversations uh, happening outside. In an older study, uh, McNulty, Terry McNulty and uh, Andrew Pettigrew, uh, studying board meetings, show very nicely how the pre-meeting talk en enables the board members uh, to increase chances of the acceptance of their proposals. You might say that's not so surprising. It is not very surprising because we all know that probably from our own experience, from our own practice, but we don't really have much research really showing exactly how such uh, uh, um, uh, interactions uh, around the meeting influence what is happening inside the meeting. Uh, Looking particularly at how the uh, non-discursive aspects uh, around uh, of the organizational context affect uh, um, talk in, inside meetings. Um, so the second point uh, in what I uh, uh, highlighted before is, uh, is very nicely shown in a study by Asmus and uh, Oshima in 2012. Um, um, Beata Asmus, uh, she shows how uh, the hierarchical position of the participants shapes very much the possibilities for contributing 
uh, two strategic discussions, and particularly what they look at is a strategic plan. Yeah? And um, they show that people in superior positions, yeah, in higher positions like the CEO, they have it much easier to uh, uh, make new proposals um, or proposals for changes to the strategic plan, and they also uh, have their um, and uh, they are seen as having the right to put forward proposals, whereas people in more subordinate positions spend quite a lot of time in negotiating the right to make proposals. Yeah? So much more time and effort is uh, spent uh, uh, um, by these people in subordinate positions, first of all, to, uh, to generate the right to make a proposal. Yeah? And they have to be uh, successful, first of all, in uh, getting the, uh, um, accepted in making proposals in order to be able to affect uh, or to influence the strategic plan. Okay, so this uh, moves me into um, my um, uh, fifth point. Um, here I want to talk particularly about uh, strategy workshops. Strategy workshops as a, a particular type of uh, a particular type of meeting. Yeah? Uh, and uh, in strategies practice research, you find a lot of studies now um, uh, looking at workshops and particularities of workshops. In the next point, I will talk about particularly about inter-organizational workshops, which is sort of within the studies on workshops, a very specific area. Okay, so what are strategy workshops? Strategy workshops are a particular type of meeting. Um, uh, Jared Hodgkinson and colleagues define it as the practice of taking time out from day-to-day -day routines to deliberate on the long-term direction of the organization. So it's a kind of meeting that is taking place outside of the day-to-day -day routines uh, in order to deliberate on the long-term direction of the organization. Such workshops are used for very different purposes. They are often used uh, to initiate strategic change. Organizations that are in a crisis situation uh, often use strategic uh, um, strategy workshops to come up with uh, new ideas for, re, uh, uh, for a turnaround of the organization or for, for a new strategic direction of the organization. Or from time to time, you might just initiate a strategy workshop in order to reflect on the current position and coming up with a future direction of the organization. Sometimes strategy workshops are just used for communicating strategy, um, also down to the employees um, or to the middle managers or whatever. And uh, often they're also used as a tool of strategy implementation and so on. So different purposes of strategy workshops. Sometimes they're just used for, um, for team building uh, and so on. What I'm particularly interested in, and most of the research has been particularly interested in, is the role of strategy workshops in initiating strategic change because there are some particular characteristics of strategy workshops that uh, make them uh, particularly fruitful as a means of or quite a powerful uh, tool uh, in, uh, for initiating strategic change. So uh, before I get into that, uh, let me show you some statistics, um, particularly from a study uh, by Jared Hodgkinson in, uh, and colleagues in 2006, uh, 2006. And another, that's a study in the UK, and another study that I did with a colleague um, or several colleagues in, in Switzerland looking at uh, uh, um, strategy workshops in Switzerland uh, or Switzerland and Germany. Actually, it's a, um, a very similar study and with very similar results. Just generally to give you a sense of uh, the figures here. Um, strategy workshops are found in more than 70% of all, uh, I have to say, medium sized and large organizations. Um, in the very small organizations, they're, they're less. Um, they last between half a day to several days. And uh, more than 70% of those um, workshops take place away from the organizational premises. At the bottom, you see some. Uh, some charts that uh, from the study by Jared Hodgkinson and colleagues uh, uh, um, showing the, the splits in, in different lengths and, and uh, frequencies. Okay, so um, strategy workshops are a pervasive phenomenon that happen very widely, and that is uh, that alone is a reason to study them. But actually, they are interesting because they have an effect. So um, in um, 
And the effect that strategy workshops have, and particularly the effect they have on initiation of new strategies, has to do has something to do with the way they relate to the structures of the organization at large. In a conceptual piece with uh, John Hendry, who was my former su PhD supervisor, um, we uh, we conceptualize strategy workshops as uh, we, as uh, um, strategic episodes, where um, uh, as we write, the basic function of a strategic episode is simply to make it possible to suspend and replace structures for a certain time period. So what I've uh, um, sort of tried to graphically represent at the bottom, you could see here, or you could have, uh, you have the organizational routines and structures on the left-hand side, uh, the, the four lines, uh, these are sort of symbolizing the structures. And then you have the beginning of the strategy workshop, which is typically sort of suspending uh, um, if not all, um, not all, but uh, uh, um, many of the routines and structures of the organization. You go outside of the um, uh, of the um, building. Uh, you uh, become informal. You uh, um, the hierarchy is tear down or whatever. So you have typically in these uh, strategy workshops uh, a suspension of a lot of these structures. That you have in the organization. You interact informally and so on. Typically, uh, you um, uh, uh, it's uh, combined with social events and so on to really break with the routines and structures of the organization. And this, that's the argument, allows for new ideas to emerge. Yeah. And at the end of the workshop, indicated on the left hand side, when it comes to an end, the old structures are reinstated. You go back to the organization from where you were, <laughs> and then the same hierarchy, structures, uh, uh, rules, and routines are still in place. Yeah, so you just suspend for a time, uh, for a certain time, and that allows you um, sort of to reflect on the organization. So, as uh, Dawson um not looking at strategy workshops, but more generally said, strategic change usually requires stepping out of the existing management process, since these processes are set to sustain the old cognitive perspective. So what you could see here, and I go back to the figure I had before, stepping into um, <coughs> the strategy workshop actually means stepping out of a lot of the uh, routines and structures yeah, of uh, the organization. So it allows sort of getting out of um, the structures of thinking and talking uh, and, and thereby talk and think in new ways and thus come up with new ideas. Yeah. So strategy workshops in that sense allow for critical reflection of the status quo and as such also for the emergence of new ideas. Uh, taking this idea of uh, the strategy episode one step further, uh, a study by Johnson, Jay Johnson and colleagues um, uh, examined strategy workshops as liminal experience, yeah? which is actually is capturing exactly this idea of workshops or strategy episodes being both within the organization, apart from of the organization, but also outside. They allow you to look at the organization as if, uh, uh, as if outside, from outside. Yeah. So uh, strategy workshops, they say, create a liminal experience. The extent to which they actually create this liminal experience, the uh, extent to which they actually take people out of the organization, depends on several issues. First, the level of ritualization of the workshop. Yeah. Drawing on ritual theory, they said, actually, uh, you can look at workshops as ritualized events. Yeah. Oh, we are going on a work strategy workshop. Yeah, it's like a ritual. Yeah, we are removed. Yeah, rituals typically remove you from uh, where you typically are. There's a liturgy, like in, in, in church, there's a liturgy. You follow certain prescribed uh, forms of interaction in the uh, workshop. Uh, prescribed forms of interaction are very different from what you do uh, in the organization. You dress informally. Yeah, that's also prescribed form. So you cannot turn up, uh, you might not be able to turn up with tie and suit, if, even though you're always interacting in tie suit in the office yeah uh, you have to turn off your mobiles or whatever so there are certain practices that are typical uh, typically used and you use particular tools also uh, um, uh, particular tool workshop tools that are typical for workshops you use specialists and workshop facilitators that are, are similar to the specialists that you have in in uh, uh, religious rituals Okay, that is uh, the level of ritualization of the workshop. Then, uh, in order for the liminal experience really to uh, take off, you also need a legitimation of the liturgy and the specialist. If the liturgy, liturgy and the specialist are not considered legitimate, 
Um, then no, no liminal experience will emerge. People will not get this liminal experience. And finally, um, uh, the, the people in authority also need to signal the suspension of structural roles of the people. Yeah, you are no longer uh, in the me in the strategy uh, um, uh, workshop as a uh, uh, in a particular uh, in your particular. Uh, organizational function in your particular organization role, you're informal and so on. But this has also been signaled by people in authority. The CEO is dressing down yeah, uh, in, uh, in in jeans and, uh, and uh, flip-flops or whatever. So, so also uh, signaling here the suspension of structural roles. Yeah? I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit to give this image. So or the, to, to make this uh, uh, the idea clear. Okay, so Johnson, uh, Jerry Johnson and colleagues argue that uh, it takes these three aspects to create a liminal experience. And the more these three aspects are met, the more people in the workshop will have this liminal experience. They won't always have it, but uh, uh, if these three aspects are met, they argue uh, they will have a liminal experience. The experience of being neither inside nor outside the organization, both in and uh, both out, sort of in between. Yeah. And that leads Two two important uh, uh, exper uh, um, experience uh, to, uh, uh, um, behaviors. First, anti-structure. Yeah. So actually, the suspension of the participants' normal social status. Yeah? Something that I talked about also uh, before already. And communitas, a feeling of community and uh, uh, communal commitment to the purpose of the workshop. Uh, and um, they argue, and that's very interesting, that these two work together very much. The anti-structure and community has in text both. The, the anti-structure allows for sort of critical ideas to be voiced. Yeah, uh, You are no longer in your position. It's no longer the organizational structures that prevent or uh, direct you in what you're allowed to say and what not. You can say everything. Yeah, And the community is important because the community sort of creates uh, um, uh, um, a sense of belonging to each other so that uh, no affective conflict will emerge from criticism. And that's together very important and provides a very fruitful context for the emergence of challenging new ideas. Uh, if you're interested in that, you, uh, I advise you to read this paper. It's very interesting. It might uh, um, be a bit too complex here to follow everything that I've uh, explained so far about it, but um, the, the basic idea should be clear that sort of workshops sort of uh, uh, suspend the structures. They create at the same time a sense of community uh, of, communitas so that you can criticize while at the same time not create conflict through that. Okay, now let's move on. And uh, so I'm coming close to the last slides. Um, I said that workshops due to the liminal experience, due to, the, to being strategy episodes, lead to new ideas. But the problem that has been identified is that it's very hard to bring these new ideas back into the organization. And uh, uh, together uh, in a paper with my two Scottish uh, colleagues, uh, Don McLean and Robert McIntosh, we termed this the effectivity paradox. And uh, actually, the effectivity paradox is very well described already in Jerry Johnson's uh, um, study. They say the very separation and anti structure that strategy workshops foster may hinder the transfer of ideas and plans back to the everyday work situation. So, because our, um, these workshops are separated, from the organization at large, new ideas can emerge. However, uh, because uh, they are so much separated and so different, it's very difficult to transfer them back into the organization context. They don't fit the organization context. So in order, uh, but if the strategy workshop is not so much uh, separated and there's not so much anti-structure, um, it's much easier to bring new ideas back but the problem is you won't have new ideas if you don't separate and that don't have the anti-structure. So here you have in, you are in a paradoxical situation. You need to separate yeah, in order to have new ideas. But at the same time, you need to link to the organization in order to bring the ideas back. So how do organizations uh, 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 actually manage this paradox uh, of uh, um, linking and not linking? Yeah? Because there are some strategy workshops that do have an effect. Let me show you here a study that I did with Don, uh, Robert McIntosh and Don McLean, in which we tried to investigate how uh, um, organizations counter the affectivity paradox. What we did in the study, we had 10 organizations, they are labeled A to J here, and, and they all conducted strategy workshops. Organization A conducted 34 strategy workshops, uh, organization J just one. 
And uh, as you can see here in the last row, uh, the first three organizations, A to Z, um, these workshops generated ideas. All these workshops generated ideas across all organizations. And these ideas actually led to a change. So organization A had 34 um, strategy workshops in a row, and ultimately a change happened. So a new strategic idea was implemented. Organization J just had one strategy workshop, and the new idea that emerged or the new ideas that emerged had no impact. How do we explain this? Well, we explain this with three aspects that are important. Yeah? Duration, frequency, and seniority are important, uh, and they allow actually to uh, uh, sort of get around the effectivity paradox in some sense. Let me first uh, highlight here um, the three elements. If you look at the three uh, organizations A to C, uh, which all uh, had strategy workshops that in the end resulted in change. They all had long duration, uh, high frequency or fairly high, medium to high frequency and high seniority. Yeah. Uh, and these three aspects, and I'll explain later why, are important for change to happen. If you look at all the others, they did not have, um, they, they uh, lacked at least in one of these three dimensions. So for example, organization B, had uh, high frequency, high seniority, but low duration, yeah? uh, just three months. Um, from the first, by duration, if that's not clear, I mean uh, the first uh, workshop to the last workshop uh, was across three months. If you look at the organization F, uh, it was a long duration, but the frequency between the workshops was fairly low, um, seniority was high. Um, in the last one, J, for example, you had just one workshop, uh, frequency obviously was low, it was just one uh, duration, two days, even though seniority was high, ultimately no impact. So how do we explain this? So what we find here, single workshops are likely to produce strategic change. Effectiveness of, uh, 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 of uh, these change initiatives, whether the initiatives actually take off, depend on duration, frequency, and seniority of the participants. How do we explain this? Well, the resolution of the effectivity paradox is through a series of workshops. You need several workshops that gradually interweave um, the workshop and the ongoing uh, organizational processes. So what we have in this series of workshops, these ideas that emerge in a workshop that's far removed from the organization context are successively closed abroad to the organization context. Secondly, um, the development of new ideas requires time for experimentation, iteration, and learning. Yeah? So you need uh, several workshops uh, um, uh, to develop these ideas. It's a bit similar to the study I showed you before with Paula Jasikowski on, the, um, on how ideas have to move through several iterations of meetings within the organization in order to be taken. What is important, however, here is the frequency and rhythm uh, of uh, these workshops because they provide momentum and sustainability. And particularly, we find in those cases where workshops were far apart, low frequency, um, people often spend lots of time trying to remember what they decided before. Yeah? And that takes out uh, the momentum and, uh, uh, and uh, issues are not sustained. So sort of the die off, uh, ideas die off on the way. And seniority is important uh, because seniority also then later on signals that what has been seniority of participants, I have to say, seniority of participants is important because they signal to the organization at large that the ideas that emerge in the meetings uh, are legitimate and can legitimately be transferred in the organization at large. Again, it's a bit of a complex study, and if you're interested in it, I uh, direct you to the paper and uh, I uh, invite you to read the paper. Um, there's much more in it, but uh, these are sort of key points that I wanted to highlight. To close off, let me just briefly say something about inter-organizational workshops. Uh, one aspect, one area that is uh, cu well, well, currently quite a lot of research is being done. There's not so much published on it yet, but a lot is on the way. And I think if you're interested in studying workshops, I think um, inter-organization workshops are very fascinating. Okay, uh, what we find here is an increase in inter-organizational strategizing workshops. We see more and more organizations are getting together, joining forces, having joint uh, um, strategy workshops, inter-organizational workshops. And they do this particularly when confronted with so-called interactive momentum problems, uh, with um, uh, grand challenges, another topic that's currently very hot, uh, grand challenges when they have super wicked problems. So 
problems that are highly complex, uncertain, with unclear boundaries, where um, the individual organization is somehow challenged and does not know how to deal with it. So uh, in these inter-organizational workshops, organizations get together to jointly uh, trying to make sense of these workshops yeah? uh, and uh, also partly to develop joint strategies. But often it's not about a joint strategy, it's very much sort of to help uh, organizations making sense of that. Let's have a closer look at those. Yeah? And I did a study with my colleague uh, Felix Werle uh, in which we uh, uh, examined um, two of those inter-organizational uh, collaborations, one in which they try to get uh, a hold and to make sense of um, water scarcity as a grand challenge, and the second one uh, where they try to get uh, um, come to grips with uh, flexible production. Yeah, Because flexible production is also a highly complex uh, issue. When you look at it, it, it sort of takes you well beyond the individual organization. Okay. Um, so what we have here is um, that organization, that's the study that I did with Felix Verle, um, uh, 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 when organizations create, um, um, uh, create, create such inter-organization collaborations, oft, often in reaction to meta problems, to grand challenges, which outstretch the sense-making capacity of the individual organization. Such uh, uh, meta problems, uh, grand challenges are so complex, they take so many different, they have so many different aspects that the individual organization often lacks the knowledge, the different perspectives necessary to make sense of it. Uh, and this is problematic because, as uh, Wright uh, says, when a capacity to make sense is challenged by unexpected cues, you would say these grand challenges are unexpected cues that cannot be located within existing mental models, rejection of these can mean that important opportunities or potential threats are missed, resulting in ineffective decision making. So it's very important from a strategic point of view for organizations to come to grips with such meta problems. And what they do in the organizational uh, workshops, allow companies to pool different perspectives and to search for solutions that go beyond their own limited vision of what is possible. And let me just quickly show you three patterns in which, or three ways in which uh, uh, individual organizations make use of these inter-organizational workshops as a means of extending their own sense-making capacity. So here are three different patterns of making use of these uh, inter-organization uh, inter -organization workshops to make sense of complex issues. One is, we call it triggering sense-making. Yeah? Individual, we had a, uh, several of our organizations lacked, uh, um, severely lacked uh, sense-making capacity. They could not make any sense of, uh, of these major issues, so they use these um, inter-organizational workshops to, uh, 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 as a means of generating an understanding that they could then individually uh, use within the organization. So they send off some managers to these inter-organizational workshops. These managers discuss these issues with the other managers from other organizations. They generated an understanding of the issue uh, and uh, developed an understanding of potential reactions to the issue and then brought it back into the individual organization where they continued with their new understanding and then made sense of or uh, developed their, their sense further in the, uh, in, in the individual organization. So you first have sort of an inter-organization sense making, the understanding then is transferred into the organization. I mean, I make it sound very simple that transfer is obviously also a very complex process, but then whatever they understood um, uh, inter-organizationally, then they took into the organization and then uh, continued with that. Uh, we also had organizations that were quite advanced in understanding these complex um, issues. They had uh, more sense-making capacity. They had um, their own sense-making of the issue, but at the same time also engaged in the inter-organizational workshop and uh, sort of had a transfer of understandings between the inter-organizational workshop and the individual uh, uh, organization. So they had a parallel sense-making process. And then we also had organizations that um, started uh, making sense of the issue themselves, then they lacked some uh, capacities to make sense of particular aspects. Um, for example, in the case of water scarcity, they lacked 
uh, they lacked uh, uh, understand uh, or lacked knowledge in developing measurement tools. So they uh, used the indoor organizational workshop to generate an understanding of the measurement ways of measuring uh, water scarcity. And then they used this again uh, internally later on. This understanding generated on the indoor organization level. They used internally and continued with it. So they selectively transferred. Um, uh, um, uh, understanding from the interorganizational to the organizational level. The details again don't matter. Just uh, wanted to show uh, and I just wanted to highlight that um, individual organizations can use um, the interorganizational sense making process uh, in order to expand their sense making capacity. So. To conclude this, in contrast to the internal workshops that I talked about, in the organization workshops are not so much about suspending the organization structure and thereby allowing for you to emerge, but actually to make use of uh, sense-making capacities of other organizations. So by organizing into organization workshops, you can actually uh, make use of the perspectives of the other organization. You pool perspectives also of other organizations into the interorganizational workshop and can make use of it inside the individual organization. Okay, now let me come to my conclusion, the last uh, uh, concluding slides. First, so what do we know about meetings and workshops and strategy and research? Well, we have already identified a lot of different meeting practices and functions of meetings in organizations. Um, we have uh, confirmed that uh, uh, meetings do have an impact on strategy. They don't always have an impact on strategy, but they do sometimes have an impact on strategy. So they are very important for strategy. Yeah. So the first view that I showed you up front when we started or when I started talking, the view that meetings don't matter, actually meetings do matter and they have an impact on strategy. Uh, we also know already that the impact that meetings have on the organizational strategy depends very much on the combination of meeting practices, meeting practices within the individual meeting, but also meeting practice across meetings, the combination of meeting practice across meetings. We know that um, Strategy workshops allow suspending organization structures and thereby for novel to emerge. We also know uh, um, that uh, the more you suspend structures, the more difficult it is later to uh, bring, um, bring the results of these suspended structures and new ideas back into the organization, which we call, which is uh, now discussed on the uh, label effectivity paradox. Um, we know that series of workshops serve as a means of dissolving or dealing with the paradox. And uh, we also have a lot of research now on interorganization workshops and extension of individual sense-making capacities. So this is more or less uh, sort of summarized uh, the, the issues that I've presented you here. There are obviously more um, things that we know already, but I would say these are, at least for me, the most interesting things. Now, um, areas for further exploration. Um, what uh, uh, if you're interested in studying uh, meetings and workshops what are things that uh, we don't know much about yet or where more research is called for well um, we still need much more on the links between activities inside and outside of meetings yeah i highlight a couple of studies that have looked at that but we need much more we know very little about that uh, uh, we need more on the uh, more research on the relation between different meetings meeting series uh, we need uh, research on uh, the relation between different meeting functions, you know, where they are complementary, uh, where they are uh, um, conflicting, how these uh, meeting functions um, are distributed across different hierarchical levels, uh, meetings on different hierarchical levels. So that's something that where we need much more research on, where we know very little. We know that these functions exist, but we don't know um, uh, how they relate to each other. Uh, we need more research on suspensions in workshops when you are interested particularly in workshops. Uh, the mechanism of suspension, um, the study by Johnson et al. is a very start, a good starting point, but we need to mo know more. And, partic and in particular, um, we don't know much about these interorganization workshops, which have become more and more frequent, which have become more and more important now in phase particular of grand challenges. So if you, are looking for a topic to study, um, I think that's a good, well, well, certainly a, a, a topic that would be very hot at the moment. And then, uh, of course, many other areas, but these are the areas that came to my mind immediately. 
And with this, I come to the end. And um, I think now, um, if there are any questions, we might have still some time to answer some, or I still have time to answer some questions. I don't know how much time you have. Okay, I switch back now that you can see me again. So I'm back up and uh, I've been uh, told that uh, I would get some questions uh, if there were any during the study so you, uh, or during the talk. So I'm very happy to answer some questions. If there aren't any questions now, you um, can also feel free to uh, or feel free to uh, uh, write to me. Um, I, uh, I can also answer uh, um, questions by email. I'm also happy to Skype if there are questions. And uh, obviously, uh, you can all have my slides and uh, also references to all the papers that I uh, indicated. And if you want any of the papers that I have, I'm also happy to send them to you. So I don't see any questions coming in at the moment. No questions, right? No questions. Okay, that's uh, what I got as uh, um, indicated. Okay, since there are no questions, I thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to this uh, presentation. Um, what I wanted to do is to give you an overview of uh, research in this exciting field of uh, um, strategy workshops and strategy meetings. Um, I think it is very exciting. It's a very hot topic. And if you haven't decided what to study, study meetings, study workshops, and I hope to see you at one of the big conferences, strategy as practice conferences. And if you have any question, questions, you're always welcome to contact me. Thank you very much. And that's the end. Thank you.